And I'm going to begin in verse 1, but we're going to focus on verse 6. I mean 9, I'm sorry. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also putting them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. And do not lie to one another. Since you laid aside the old man and itself and its evil practices and put on the new self who is being renewed to the true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal of which there is no distinction between Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. All right, we're going to focus on verse 9 where it says, do not lie, and it's interesting how when Paul begins in verse 5, he says, Therefore consider the members of your body dead to immorality, passions, evil desires, greed, and all these things which uh, amount to idolatry. And then he goes on down and he, he lists the, the sins of the tongue. He says uh, slander, abusive speech, don't let them come out of your mouth. And then he gives a, an imperative. It is do not lie. And it is hot. What is a lie? Untruth. All right. What else? What else is a lie? Is that dark enough for y'all to see that there? Do I need to make it bigger and bolder? I washed the boys this morning um, with some spray, and it might not be taken. I it's clear. This is a clear pen. <laughs> <laughs> what else is a, can we define a lie as? Half truth. Half truth? <laughs> what else? Omission of truth. Now, whoever said these, y'all got to define them, so be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What else? <laughs> what else? Deception. Who said that? My husband. That is actually where I would have started. That's a very wise man. Is that a lie? <laughs> I have just told a half truth. Deception. All right, what else? Anyone? 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 It's a sin. What is? It's this line. Is this a sin? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Are you ready to, to defend that position? Okay. <laughs> Is all deception wrong? All right. Nobody wants to answer that yet. So we'll go through these and then. 
Is every non-truth a lie? No. Who said that? No. So you have like the instance of Rahab in the Old Testament. That's what I was thinking about. Rahab, mm -hmm. she lied, and we're going to talk about that though. And what just what made the distinction between the lie is going to be these two things. The intent, just keep this in mind. Man, that is just not working. The intent of the one speaking, okay? The intent of the one speaking, and then the expectation of the one that hears. That's what's going to determine if this is a lie and, and, and how bad of a whopper it can be. So it, is every non-truth a lie? Did she, we'll just take Rahab, did she lie to them? Yes. Okay, so what she told was a non-truth, therefore it's a lie. But is every non-truth a lie? Me and Sybil take the kids to the zoo. And she says, that's a rhinoceros. And I say, no, that's a duckbill platypus. I really thought it was a duckbill platypus. Okay, I, I was wrong. It was a non-truth, but did I lie to my kid? No, I did not. So not every non-truth is a lie. Ignorance. What's that? I just said ignorance. I mean, ignorance. If you speak something in ignorance, ignorance meaning not just in stupidity, but actually lack of knowledge. That's actually what ignorance means. It's just lack of knowledge. We speak in something... And we do it in such a way that we don't know, and we're speaking. You're you're saying something just in error. Paul said he was ignorant when he was doing what he was doing. Yeah, yep. Half truth is is a half truth a lie? I think there's intention to to deceive there. No. Let's. Uh, what what would be the one we can think of pretty recently in our study in Genesis? Half truth. She my sister. Yep. Yeah, Is what he said true about her being his sister? Yes. But what was his intent? To deceive um, Abimelech. To, to deceive him. Right. That's what that's so now we're looking, okay, why did he say what he said? I'm going to get busy. <laughs> Why did he say what he said? His intent was to deceive his hearer, and the expectation of his hearer was to be deceived. Therefore, what Abraham did was wrong. Okay? What Abraham did was wrong. Is the omission of truth a lie? I know we probably told our kids that, haven't we? Can we go back to the, the intent and the goes back to the intent. What's the intent? Information for self gain. Sure. Then. So just the admission of truth does not mean there's always a lie. The word is pseudeste or pseudomai, and it means false, pseudo, right? False speaking. So are we speaking in such a way that we're trying to deceive that person to make either ourselves look better and them look worse? So it always goes back to this here, the intent and expectation. What was the intent? Um, when we think of, uh, we could use the instance for Rahab, and if y'all want to turn there, we could read that or I just recall the story. It's not, the, the, the narrative is not told in order. She puts them up on the roof, then it goes back to what has happened. So Y'all remember that. It says, oh, she hit them up on the roof, then it goes back to the narrative of her talking about the people knocking on the door, where are they at? She knew that the Lord had already given them the city and that she was safe, right? Everybody remember the story? Story, the actual real story narrative she still after being knowing that the city had been given into their hands she put them up on the roof they had already given her safety she lied to save her life 
That was lack of trusting in the Lord of what they had already revealed to her. I think it's in uh, Joshua chapter 2 or 3. You can go look at it. Hey, is is despise deception? We can even go that far. Did they send spies? Did the children did, did did Joshua send spies into the into Canaan? What are spies? Is that not a form of deception? Observation. <laughs> but they were deceiving them. They were coming into a land to spy on them. There's a this is a huge rubric that deception is not always wrong. It always goes back to the intent and the expectation. Matter of fact, you're really going to have some major issues when you look at Joshua and he says, you go into AI and you set an ambush and you trick them to think you're going this way and then you go in and you kill them all. God told him to do that. So it's all in war. It's time. There's a time for deception. But in dealing with one another, which is what this is talking about, we're not to lie to one another. So you still have to do... Go ahead. I'm sorry. You still have to deal with the issue of the midwives. Because the midwives... You can say, did, did they lie? You're talking about the midwives at the time when Moses was born? Right. Okay. And then you look at it and what it says that God dealt well with the midwives. So, I mean... But did God deal did God deal well with them because they preserved life or because they lied? No, I'm just saying that's another one. Sure. We would, we would have to kind of look at it in total rather than just pinpoint in one in one situation. Sure. And it, there's a lot of like in, in, in Rahab's case and in the midwife's case, what bothers you and I when we read those is the scripture's morally neutral on what happened. I don't know if you ever noticed that. They don't say whether it was right or wrong because that's not the point of the story or the, the narrative. The point was that God used the midwives, in particular case that Andy's talking about, God used the midwives to preserve whose life? The deliverer of Israel. Now, he didn't say that, hey, it was okay for them to lie. He didn't say that. But that's not the point of the uh, of the narrative. Neither was the point of the narrative of the, the lack of faith in Rahab after she was given safety. She lies to spare her life. Look, her life was already spared. But she lied. Look, man, a great act of faith that immediately goes into a great act of unbelief that she was that this person in Rahab was going to have her life taken if they found out that the spies were in her place. And, inside her home um deception is often used in and we can say is in uh in the uh, uh, david and in joshua and it was given it was sanctioned by god but under the the, the rubric of war <laughs> and it goes back to the intent the intent and under the rubric of war was to deceive your enemy did the the the, the, the enemy Expect at some point for them to try to be deceived. Okay. So they knew that, hey, in this, what we're doing, there's going to be some deception and back and forth. But in dealing with lying to one another is rooted in the Old Testament of not bearing false witness. Okay. Not Do not lie in the New Testament is rooted in the fact that under the Mosaic law, we are not to bear false witness. Anybody remember what the not bearing false witness meant? Anybody? Had to do with being in the court of law. Didn't have to do with, hey, uh, Andy caught a fish this big. I, was he, it was, I see, I told you. <laughs> and he wrestled it to the shoreline for four hours. You see, that's not what that's talking about. It's talking about bearing false witness, lying against someone in such a way to either cause harm to them or their character. 
you can go back and look in Deuteronomy chapter 19. If I, if me and uh, Keith got together and lied about Andy in such a way that Andy had to pay restitution or something had to happen to Andy under the Mosaic law and they found out that me and Keith were wrong, what we were trying to do to him was to be done to us. So, and under the Mosaic law, if we were lying, saying that so-and-so did something worthy of death, and they found out after an investigation that it was wrong, you know who got put to death? The liar. The liar did. Go back and read Deuteronomy 19. Go back and read it. So, not every lie, not every non-truth is a lie. Not every half-truth is a lie, because sometimes we're ignorant of things but it goes back to the intent is my intent to tell half the truth to deceive the person to make myself look better and then look worse now the omission of truth we do with the omission of truth is that a lie why did we what are you doing squinting at me you said it Good. Lee, you were going to say something? Oh, no. oh, he said, no, no. That oh, seems like he would be more deceptive than... <laughs> well, what if you have lack of truth? The other two. Well, yeah. What, I mean, what if you're limited I mean, in your knowledge like, well, and you even, find out... Go ahead. No, well, we've got children. You know, we had young children one time. And you beat them all for lying to you. Say there's something that, that's dangers that you know we're going into an ice storm right now we're while we're traveling yep we don't need to describe to them that if we spin off and go down in this ditch we're probably going to die out here we just say you know things are kind of icy right now let's pray you know so there's there's additional information that we could give to the kids but is it to their benefit to know these things it's not needed at that point right. at that juncture right okay at that juncture it may not be necessary for them to know intent. but his intent was not to deceive yeah. his intent was to protect yeah. right they all have to, to not scare not to go oh yeah let me uh let me give them the expectation that that the that the little swirly line in the road means <laughs> oh no the grim reaper's just beyond the road the, the sign that's not what you were saying you're you're saying my intent is to let them know just enough let them know that hey this could be dangerous but dad's gonna take care of you that's letting them know all the stuff but in paul's case back to colossians the intent that he is dealing with was the intent to deceive let me get to my pages are sticking together and it's to harm one another and it's backed up i could say with abusive speech is lying to deceive someone abusive speech it's a form of it. Sure. Uh, certainly. We could, we could all say this. Is slander a form of lying? Yeah? No? Yeah. You're talking bad about someone. Can gossip be a form of lying? Yes, ma'am. What's that? If you know truth about someone, it doesn't always need to be spoken. That would be a mission of truth. Because you're not wanting to gossip about that. Person. Yeah, uh, um, clarify that for a second. I, I think okay, I. So you know the background on someone. Yes, ma'am. And you're speaking with another person, and they say, "Oh," and they're talking about this person. And they're saying positive things. You know, truth that would be more negative, and it's not necessary. You can omit that truth. You don't have to tell that person because it would be gossip. Well, it could be, but if the point, if your intention. Your if your intention is to cause harm to that person's character exactly. or to cause harm to that person's reputation or to uh, elevate, put yourself, put, put yourself on a teeter-totter, I'm going to make myself look better so that they look debased. What's the intent? That is the intent. It all goes back to the intent of the heart. Why do you think that God says this? He will judge the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Hey, you and me at times can say things that we think is done in good motive. Is that not true? And then about three days later, when we start reflecting on what was said and done, we might go, you know what? I was a jerk. You know, or what I said was um, not true. You know, I have to go back and apologize to that person for lying, misleading. I mean, I would say our most easiest way of lying is to mislead someone. 
And that goes back to the intent. What is my intent? Is my intent to mislead this person or to be true, be truthful? What does the word of God say? In, the chapter, in Ephesians chapter 4, speak the truth in love. Can you lie in love? Just think about it. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> or Sybil, did that gallon of milk really cost a hundred dollars? So, 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 yes, sir. This. So, um, someone comes up to you and they say, How do I look? I was already told I better tell her what I think. Don't you let me go out the house looking cray cray. <laughs> At the same time, there's intent involved, right? So it's like self preservation. <laughs> but really, I mean, that's a consideration. It has to go back intent to the heart, right? Because that's where it all proceeds from. The lies come from the heart, right? Sure. So when you think about that, I'm not going to put my, I'm not sticking my head in the lion's mouth. If my wife asks me how she looks, I'm telling her she's beautiful, right? I mean. Well, it's usually the other way around, but <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> See, she's being obedient. Yeah. Do yeah. not lie. So it has to go back to the intent. What is the intent? Is our intent to to deceive our brother. In this particular case, we're dealing with inside the local assembly within the Christian community is our intent to deceive brother or sister. Is there any time we should deceive our brother or sister? Just think about it. Is there any time? I say no. Why would we want to deceive our brother and sister? Certainly, if someone is walking in a way that's not consistent with the word of God, we should not go in and tell them, hey, I know you're struggling. You're going to get through this. No, no, you need to give them, hey, this dangerous in the road in which you're going. The Bible says if you, if you keep going down the road that you're going, the steps that you're taking lead to unbelief. Unbelief leads to apostasy. Apostasy leads to utter destruction. Okay, that, that would, did you raise your hand? No. Uh, uh, um, She's scared to now. Yeah. So that's why there's never a time that we should deceive. And if we do have information that can protect our brother and sister in Christ, we need to tell. We need to tell for whatever it is. You know, could somebody, let's say some guy comes in. Um, well, I can speak specifically. Um, and since um, a church that some of y'all know I was at that I left could no longer serve my good conscience. I was always the default person for three or four years you know, ongoing, wasn't it? That this person wound up taking another position at another church. You know who they called? Me. And finally, my wife had enough of it, and I was thankful that she did. And she called one of those people and says, y'all need to call and warn the church about that man. Quit calling my husband. But they knew once that I was contacted, I had a, in my conscience, they needed to know that this, they need to be warned that this man is a wolf in sheep's clothing. So there is a part of that where we should, if we know something about someone and, they, and, and, and they're a danger to the, the body of Christ, sure, they need to know. That's a, a time not to omit the truth. <laughs> it's a time to, to let people know. Um. It says, do not lie to one another. That means we can lie to people outside the body? <laughs> Does it? Anybody scared to answer that one? No. Yes, ma'am. No, the, the thing I keep thinking of is that age-old argument about, you know, hiding Jews during the Holocaust. And a lot of Christians hid Jews and, and told the, you know, the soldiers, whatever, that no, there was no one there, and that was, you know, that's called a righteous act. Sure, so. I, I don't. I, that's never happened to me. I can't say what I would do in that situation, and I'm not going to have to stand before God and answer for what they did. I, I don't know what I would do. Well, that, that's yeah. why it yes. comes up because we don't know what's going to happen either, and we don't know if we're ever going to be in that position. You know, I mean, sometimes things seem like they're closer 
Sure. And I know that and, and, and Jesus said he'll give you what to do on that day. Yep. Lee. That, that, that situation of ethics and that that can that can be a rationale for lying, but you could there is a third thing you could say when the Nazis come. It's, yeah, I've got a whole attic full of them. Hey. <laughs> Anybody remember the fourth century church father Athanasius? Anybody remember him? He's actually the one who was uh, at the Council of Nicaea going against Arius during the Arian controversy. Anybody remember all that? Arian controversy, the deity of Christ. Oh boy. All right, went. Roll the wind up on me. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Athanasius, and it was Athanasius against the world, is really how it was coined. Athanasius was looked, he was exiled five times, and out of 17, out of, out of those five times he was exiled by the Roman Empire, he spent 17 years in exile. Well, they ran, some people looking for Athanasius ran up, his pursuers ran up to Athanasius and said, Has anybody seen Athanasius? And he said, if you look a little closer, he might be near. <laughs> now, did was Athanasius lying? <laughs> no, he did not. Called preservation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got to remember, that was a time when they didn't have uh, wanted people in the back of milk cartons. You can't go into the post office and see pictures of these people. And they didn't walk around with sketches uh, or on their phones of wanted men. And Athanasius said, no, if you look a little closer, you might find him. Now, was it a preservation? Yeah. But did he did he use did did he lie to them? No. He used a, a, a type of speech. Anybody know what called equivocation is? Yeah, it's when you use ambiguous speech to not reveal truth. And that's what he did. He was a smart guy. But um, so there. To, to answer the question or to deal with the, the subject of the Nazis and all that, I don't know what I would do. I've never been in that position. I hope I'm never in that position, but I know that I trust in the Lord and what he would do on that day. He'd give me the words to speak. Um, anybody else have something to say about that? No, but you can put that in any situation. Sure. Some guy comes into my house and he, yep. he wants my wife. And she's, you know, she's in the other room and he says, where is she? And I say, it's game on. She went, she went to see him often. You know, yeah. I mean, those are the kinds of things we, again, it still goes back, as you said, to the intent and, and what the expectation is on the part. If someone is seeking harm against, yeah, I mean, we have to begin to think about what's our obligation to someone who has an ill intent. And to me, it's fight. <laughs> yeah. That's me. So, um, you have to think about the other side of it. A man breaks into your house and asks where your wife is. You're not ever going to say, oh, she's over there. Yeah. She's in the next room. Over. You know what I'm saying? I'd be like, hey, Sybil, cook the guy some dinner. Okay. You know, I mean, if you know they're evil, obviously the person knocking at the door looking for Andy. Do we have, we don't even have to speak to them. To answer your yeah, question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we don't even have to speak. Yeah, yeah, we don't even have to speak to them in such a way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. I would just, I would say, though, that the moral ethic of preserving life supersedes the moral aspect of deception in cases like the midwives, Rahab, and the stuff about preserving life. Because you were saying Rahab was trying to preserve her life, but I also think that if those men had come in, if the pursuers had come in, they would have taken the two men, obviously, that would come to spy. Be careful taking the moral high road. Just let you know. Be careful. And potentially into their lives. Yeah. Just but, be, care uh, be careful making a moral, be careful making a moral distinction on what's righter or what's wronger. Okay. Just be careful because now what happens, and I'm not saying this is what you did, but dude, that's a study Bible Sunday school answer to that very thing. And don't, don't mean that as a, okay. Well, this was morally wrong, but this is morally better. Well, now you're, you're, you're tiptoeing into the realm of relativism, which you go, okay, well, that was wrong for them. That may not be wrong for me. This is the moral standard. God says we're to preserve life. Well, you know, that's not always the case because God said, you go in and kill every one of a man, woman, boy, and girl. What you going to do with that? 
got to answer that question. When God said man, woman, boy, girl, infant. So be careful. I said, don't take it as rebuke. Just be careful. You have to be careful what you're going to say, what's moral and what's not. God has declared what moral is. And that's the reflection of his character. And he has deemed what's right and wrong, not you and I. So Spurgeon said if he had to choose between two evils, he chooses neither. He would choose neither? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Spurgeon. <laughs> so, but, but we have to be careful in doing looking for well, this is more moral than that. We have to be careful doing that because then it becomes, we go down the road of going, well, that person, may, what's that? You can apply it sure. That's called relativism. And you go, then, then right doesn't become right. It can become just ethically, um, ethically supported by society. That's off the charts today. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So sorry, Stephen, if you don't take it. Okay. No, okay. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Anybody else before uh, we I move? Got a, I got a, a question. Yes. When I was working, sometimes uh, I was the next in charge of things would happen at work. And I'd just get home and sit down, and the phone rings, and Shirley answers it. And when she says, yes, I know it's for me. I'd get up, run outside, and then she would. I tell her, tell her I'm not in the house. Is that lying? Do I'm what? Not inside. What's it? What? What? What's your intent? And what was the expectation? <laughs> Uh, there, there's a there, there's a lot that can be said about deception, lying. We certainly couldn't do all of it today um, because there is um, there is a form of what we would say uh, lying that we would say is is okay. I mean, we say we give jokes. Look, I'm painting sometimes, and there'll be little kids running around the house, and the kids come say, "Hey, what are you doing?" I'll say, "I'm parachuting." <laughs> Okay, or I'll give them some crazy. I'm horseback riding. I mean, I did I tell them a non-truth? Yeah, did I lie to them? No, it's it for instance in humor. That would be like, and also we use it in hyper, uh, hyperbolic language. When Jesus said, "If your right eye offends, you pluck it out," was Jesus lying, or was Jesus speaking in such a way to develop a point of using radical methods to rid the sin in your life? Was Jesus lying? I don't think anybody here is going to say that. No, he was using, he didn't mean literally poke out your eye. So we have things like hyperbolic language. Um, it's called jokey lying. That's kind of the theological term because we joke in telling untruth. Um, what about a person like it? We'll just take Keith, for instance. We're out there doing the fishing hole, and he does some, you know, for him to do magic trick with his hands. Dude, he's deceiving people with their eyes. Okay. Is he lying to them? No. The, his intent is to get them to start thinking that their heart's deceitful above all things that's desperately wicked. If I can deceive you very quickly with my hands, then how easily can your heart deceive you and lead you astray? So, once again. What's the intent of the person speaking? And what's the expectation of the response to the person that they're speaking? It should always, if you're, in, like I said, once again, if it's to debase them and elevate yourself to bring um, uh, elevation to, uh, to one's, uh, someone else's uh, reputation, um, character, and to debase somebody else's for the purpose, purpose of defaming someone it's lying and it's deceptive and it's wrong and um, we got five minutes for so when you think about it in light of all these one another so we deal with lying over one another but with all these one another's the real consideration to me is that we are seeking to build one another up and if we're seeking to build one another up then all these things 
should be things that we constantly work on and work at. Because if we don't, then we're just no different. And that's what he says even in Colossians. He says, we was something, and now there's something else. And we ought to put more and more, even as he uses the term, put off the old man, put on a new man. Yeah. So, so as you think about it as a, as a whole, within the body of Christ, all these things are to, to an end of building one another up, glorifying God, and, and adding, if you will, to the community of believers. I'm talking about within the confines of a local church. Sure, yeah, and if we're and if we're putting off the old man, and actually that's in the um, present tense, we're putting off the old man. And in the, the, the Greek word, understanding of it is basically unzipping a suit and dropping it to the floor, stepping over here, stepping in another suit, and zipping up that new suit. So you're taking off the old man, and you're putting on the new. If I'm taking off the old man, which was characterized by lying, deception, deceit, slander, abusive speech, immorality, sexual immorality, perverse desires, all of those things, then why would I, if, if I'm putting off those things, why would I want to lie to my brother and sister in Christ? Why? should have no desire to do that. You realize... I don't know how close y'all have been to someone and have the trust violated. I'm talking about just on a friend relationship. Have someone lie to you in a grievous way. Dude, that, that right there, I would rather somebody punch me. That punch, it'll feel better in a day or two. Black eye will go away. Straighten your nose out. You know, taste blood for a few days, it'll be over. But man, that once that... That heart has been cut through deception or lying, and the trustworthiness is gone. That hurts for a long time. That hurts for a long time. Yes, sir. If you lie, you're showing respect to the father of lies. It's a good way of looking at it. Sure. Yeah. And when you tell the truth, you're acting consistent with God's character. We're acting consistent with God's character. All right. Three minutes. Isn't it interesting? I've always uh, I've told my boys this growing up and tried to give them the example of you don't have to teach somebody to lie. No, you don't. It's, it's there. Yeah. You yeah. Fight against that. Yeah, I didn't have to tell the kids, hey, when uh, I come in here and I ask who did that, now if you tell me a big whopper, you're going to get away with it. <laughs> no, they did it on their own. Yeah. I mean, scripture's clear. It's not anything that you have to instill in somebody. It says, out of the womb, men come speaking lies. So when we've been regenerated, we've been converted, our desire is to no longer deceive and lie. It's to speak the truth in love. That's what our desire should be. And if you don't have a desire to speak the truth in love and you don't have a desire for the truth, huge question mark in front of your salvation. I'm not talking about struggle, okay? I'm talking about if there's no desire for the truth. Because Jesus said, and I'll shut up. Jesus said, I'm gonna when I leave, I'm gonna send somebody. It is expedient that I go away. And when I go away, I'm gonna send someone just like me. And he's not gonna be with you, he's gonna be in you, and he will lead you and guide you into all truth. So if the spirit of God lives within you, <laughs> you you shouldn't be a liar. You should be a truth teller. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you have came and with the power of the regeneration of the spirit, Father, you have quickened our dead spirits and you have given us new life and that you have given us an understanding of your word, Father, that leads us and guides us to all truth. Father, I pray today that you would be with us in our time of corporate worship. I pray that you would be with Keith and that you would Give him strength and that you would send forth your spirit, Father, anointing his words, that we would be more conformed into the image of your blessed Son. In Christ's name, amen.